Jerusalem, the holy city. Nowhere on earth has inspired such love, hatred, and passion. For thousands of years, people have come here to meet with their God. Jerusalem, they believe, is a gateway to heaven. Here, they're as close as they can physically be to the divine. But although they worship the same God, they do so in different ways. One God has inspired three great religions. All three love Jerusalem, but all three have claimed it as their own. The city has been conquered, destroyed, and rebuilt over 20 times in 30 centuries. In the Middle Ages, there were maps which placed Jerusalem at the center of the known world. And in some ways, the world has not changed. No city has a greater concentration of journalists. A stone is thrown here, a shot is fired, and the news reverberates around the globe. This dusty Middle Eastern town can still capture the imagination like nowhere else. This is the story of people past and present who have tried to make sense of this town, to understand its power, to live with its holiness. Judean hills in the eastern Mediterranean. Here, more than 5,000 years ago, with the first breath of civilization, men discovered a mountain. And for reasons that cannot be explained, they knew that this mountain was a link to the divine. It was holy. We do not know what gods were first worshipped here. It may have been Shalem or Baal, but a city slowly grew around this place. And then a thousand years later, a warrior king came and took this city from the Jebusites, and he made it his capital. Only a few ancient walls now remain. And he brought with him a new god. This was to be the only god. And his name was Yahweh. The warrior king was David, who had made the twelve tribes of the Jews into one. And his God had no form or physical shape. The only evidence of his presence was an ark. The Ark of the Covenant. David brought the ark to his city, and his son Solomon the Wise placed it on the mountain. And he built a great temple around it. This was now the home of God. Three thousand years later, that holy mountain lies hidden under a great platform made of stone, the Temple Mount. No temple remains, but Jews from all over the world still gather at the remnant of the ancient wall which supported it. God's presence is believed to have escaped the temple's destruction and to live on in this place. The divine presence rests literally on the other side of that wall. Everybody comes to talk to God. People 
can ask for whatever they want. They can ask for a new car and a, or a new apartment or a, a wife or a husband or healthy children or health for themselves or whatever it is that they want. They know that this is somehow the place where that conversation is a little more real and a little more immediate. Here, they're praying. For Baruch Kaplan, these stones lie at the very center of his faith. For me personally, I can touch my relationship with God to the extent that I can touch these stones because these stones have been standing here listening to the prayers of mankind, most particularly Jews, for thousands of years. Packed between the stones of the wall are countless messages and prayers. The city has appointed a special mailman to deal with the thousands of letters that arrive each week in Jerusalem addressed to God. People from all over the world write to us in about 90 languages. Usually people have different questions to God and they ask for help. What I do is to take those wishes, those letters, to the waning wall. I have here one of uh, a lot of letters that came from the States. A doctor writes to God and he asks him to help to cure his patients. Anyhow, I don't think that I would like to be his, one of his patients. But what of the site of the Jewish temple on the very summit of that holy mountain? Directly above the western wall stands a magnificent Islamic shrine. The Dome of the Rock was completed in the year 691, when Jerusalem was ruled by the Muslims. Within its walls can still be found the bare pinnacle of the mountain. Central to the faith of Muslims and Jews, it is believed that here, on this rock, Abraham offered his son as a sacrifice to God. This shrine was built in his honor. The Jews call this rock Evan Hestia, the stone of foundation. They believe that this is the point from which the world was created and that it lay at the very heart of their temple. This rock also lies at the heart of the Islamic faith, where it is known as El Sakra. According to the Quran, the Prophet Muhammad was brought here one night on a winged horse. He climbed onto the rock and ascended to heaven, where he conversed with the ten great prophets of Islam and Allah himself. He then returned to earth, remounted his horse, and flew back to Mecca, all before daybreak. This is a miracle. This is a miracle. This is for me. Something overcome, over logic. Shireen al -Araj is a devout Muslim born in Jerusalem. She has been coming to the Dome of the Rock since childhood. I like the feeling that everybody is coming here, like all the Muslims from all over. We have the same feeling, we share the same thing. I mean, everybody is praying, everybody is uh, thinking, everybody is charging himself, everybody is cheering up. You will, if you go around, you'll find a lot of people crying. Even men, which is there, they try to hide their crying, but they are. You will find a lot of people feeling that this this spiritual place, and this is the place where nobody can get them out. Four hundred yards away, the bells ring out at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the center of the third faith of Abraham, Christianity. Within this building's walls lies another holy rock, the Rock of Golgotha, upon which it is believed Christ was crucified. 
and the holy sepulchre the site of his tomb. This church was built in 1149, but legend has it that the holy sites had been picked out more than 800 years earlier by the Roman Empress Helena. Her son Constantine had been the first Roman Emperor to convert to Christianity. In 312 AD, as he led his army into battle, he had a divine vision. After his victory, he declared that Christianity was now an official faith of the empire. The world would never be the same. His mother is also believed to have had miraculous visions. When Constantine brought her to Jerusalem, Helena pointed out the tomb, the rock, and the true cross itself, hidden inside a nearby cistern. As the day begins, the faithful gather at the unction stone, where they believe Christ was washed and prepared for burial. This is what uh, makes these places so special, knowing that it happened here. And of course, uh, some people may say, how do you know it's exactly here or not 10 meters away? It doesn't matter. I know that it was here, okay? And even if it wasn't here, for me, it was here. Bishop Nikophoros is a Greek Orthodox clergyman. He has served in Jerusalem for 30 years. By seeing these places, touching them, we strengthen our faith. With our imagination, we can feel the emotions and the feelings of the people that came before us. And this, being able to imagine this, is like hearing the stone speaking to you. Sepulchre, dome, wall. Three holy sites within yards of each other. Either there's God or there's no God. But if the God was anywhere on the earth, it was in Jerusalem. And for those who have faith, these rocks are a testament to his presence. The other remains, they are like the tombstones. To pretend that nothing happened here and that, that is, these are only stones. It's like reading a poem and seeing the grammar in it and the spelling, but not feeling the beauty of the poetry. When you look at the stones, it's stones. But the history soaks them with meaning. Jerusalem is also a real earthly city. Around its core sprawl shopping centers, modern suburbs and bypasses. But it is the ancient walled city at the very center of Jerusalem that is its heart. Within its walls lives one of the most diverse communities in the world. Muslims, Christians and Jews live packed together in an area of less than a square mile. It is a warren of twisting, winding streets filled with shops selling everything from pistachio nuts to religious souvenirs. Four groups have their own quarter. The Christians, the Jews, the Muslims and the Armenians. Each have their own shops and markets established over the centuries. But it is impossible for any of them to live totally in isolation. And in Jerusalem, it is also impossible to escape from the city's history, from its long and often violent past. Jerusalem is layer over layer. If you just open any asphalt road, we are already on the earlier, let's say, Ottoman Turkish days. And a few uh, feet below, you reach into older Mameluk, Crusader, Byzantine, Roman, 
second temple period, first temple period, in some places the, the accumulation is very thick, might reach to 20 and even 30 meters. Ronnie Reich is an Israeli archaeologist. He is working at the foot of the Western Wall. For him, Jerusalem's past can be as vivid as its present. I'm just leaning to the western wall of the Temple Mount area, and here on one of the huge stones of the Herodian masonry uh, is a sort of graffiti in Hebrew. Hebrew script uh, has not changed in its shape in the last 2,000 years, and actually any school uh, child can read this very easily. This is a verse from the book of Isaiah, from the Bible, and you will see and you will, and your heart will rejoice and your bones will, like grass, and one word is missing, flourish or blossom or so. We know that below this uh, pile of huge stones lies a street, a paved street, now our aim is to uncover one long path of that street. The street is very wide. Its building was done during Herod's time. That means in the first century BC. King Herod was a successful, if ruthless, ruler. He killed one of his wives and several of his sons when he found they were plotting against him. But he made his capital, Jerusalem, into one of the greatest cities of the era. His most splendid achievement was the second Jewish temple. On the pinnacle of the holy mountain, he created a vast edifice of dazzling white stone with a facade plated in gold. I feel that I am in a position a little bit different than other archaeologists working in other places in the world. For one reason, because I myself dig here my own forefathers 2,000 years ago. This brings sometimes mixed feelings because uh, I'm, dis I'm digging the destruction, the catastrophe of my forefathers. The stones that Ronnie Reich's team are lifting okay. from this ancient road are the very stones from which Herod's temple was built. In the year 66, the Jews rebelled against Roman rule. Four years later, Roman legions sacked Jerusalem and leveled the temple. The scene was horrific. The city's first great historian, Josephus, wrote, Around the altar, a pile of corpses was accumulating. Down the steps of the sanctuary flowed a stream of blood, and the bodies of those killed above went sliding to the bottom. The victors slaughtered all who were caught. The slaughter made the whole city run with blood. Jerusalem was utterly destroyed and less than 70 years later, the Jews were banished from this, their most holy city. It was a defining moment, one that shaped the identity of the Jewish people ever after. As they scattered across Europe and the Middle East in exile, they never allowed the memory of Jerusalem and its place at the center of their life to die. Jerusalem is at the core of Jewish prayer. When Jews pray, we face Jerusalem. We face Israel from outside of Israel, Jerusalem from inside Israel, the Temple Mount from inside Jerusalem. In our prayers, we talk constantly about rebuilding Jerusalem. As he digs, Ronnie Reich is still uncovering remnants of the Jewish people's great loss. You see, it's a small, a very small bottle, and this was simply trapped here in between the stones when they collapsed here during the Roman destruction. This is 1925 years ago. Past and present are always meeting here on the same level. Heaven and earth are meeting here on the same level. You cannot hear, look at the past as something that is buried. And you can look at heaven at something that is somewhere above you. Directly above Ronnie's dig lies a set of steps. Less than 40 years before the destruction of Jerusalem, a figure had walked up these steps towards the Temple Mount. He had come as a pilgrim to celebrate the Jewish feast of Passover. 
His name was Yeshua, or Jesus. Millions of people have come here since, following in his footsteps. Every Easter, thousands of Christian pilgrims gather in Jerusalem to celebrate Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. Pilgrims have been coming to Jerusalem since the days of Constantine. In the Middle Ages, they would travel from all across Europe, risking robbery, starvation and death, that they might enter Christ's tomb and touch the true cross. On Palm Sunday, the faithful gather to commemorate Christ's entry into Jerusalem. It is the beginning of the holiest week in the Christian calendar. They have been through their church services, through their reading of the Bible, through the preacher's uh, homilies, etc. And now, all those things will now come alive for them in a very, very emotional and spiritual manner. I mean, you're right there, sitting, praying, meditating in the very spot where those great events took place. For some, the pilgrimage to Jerusalem is for life. About 10 years ago, I was a rather successful corporate person in the States. Several houses, cars, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of girlfriends. And one day, I woke up with a real empty feeling. And I started asking myself some very philosophical questions. And so I sold all of my worldly belongings, as France of Assisi did and went and left and came to Jerusalem to do service for the Lord Jesus here in, in the Holy Land in Jerusalem. One of Father Peter's duties is to water the trees in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus is said to have spent the night before his crucifixion. To be in this garden, in this Garden of Gethsemane, where these very ancient trees lie, to garden around them, to realize that Jesus was there, he speaks of an experience, a spiritual experience that I cannot really expound on. But it gives me an inner sense of his spirit, an inner sense of what he suffered. Part of the pilgrims' experience of Jerusalem is to walk the Via Dolorosa. They believe that this is the very road that Christ walked on the way to his crucifixion. Six feet under this present Via della Rosa is the original pavement of the city at the time of Jesus. And as many times as I've walked this Via della Rosa with many pilgrims, this, this feeling of, of suffering, this feeling that Jesus agonized here carrying that cross in this very city of Jerusalem, his spirit is walking around every street, every little alley. For many pilgrims, to carry the cross along the Via Dolorosa is the highlight of their pilgrimage. It can be an overwhelming experience. Somebody get her. By living in Jerusalem, you learn to deal with its holiness as a matter of fact. So for us, it is always shocking to see the tourists come around endowing the stones that we pass by every day with great uh, reverence. You know, deep sorrow, deep pain, and agony. Once they get here and they go to these holy places which Christ has made holy, they sort of change. They realize where they are and there's a sense of, of holiness, there's a sense of spirit, there's a sense of deep inner joy that they experience at each of these sites. The emotion that I feel from being here is overwhelming. To get to walk where my Savior walked, just to walk down that path is, is unexpressible. I can't explain the excitement that, you know, to get to do that is such a privilege. All of a sudden it just hit me and I started crying because it's what it does to your spirit. And it just, it means so much to me to be here. I'm crying again. <laughs> we must understand, Jerusalem is something very, very special, very peculiar. It's not 
a normal city. It's a city with direct relation with heaven, with God. Dr. Barrell works at the Jerusalem Psychiatric Hospital. On occasion, pilgrims have become his patients. But we have this little group of uh, patients that we call the strictly Jerusalem syndrome. They are persons that arrive to Jerusalem as normal tourists without problems, psychological, uh, psychiatric, work, family, arrive as normal tourists. And here, in Jerusalem, they pass, they suffer for this uh, acute psychotic reaction, obsessive compulsive, that we call strictly Jerusalem syndrome. The symptoms of Jerusalem syndrome are brief, but dramatic and very specific. At its climax, sufferers wander the streets of the city, often dressed only in their hotel sheets, proclaiming loudly that they are messengers of the Messiah. It's a form of holy madness. Some people come here and they are tipped off balance. They feel they have become touched by the holy. And that touch makes them go off the edge. Have mercy on us. The morning of Good Friday, the day of Christ's crucifixion. On the Mount of Olives overlooking the city, the pilgrims gather to gaze upon the same view they believe their Savior saw 2,000 years ago. A group of American charismatic Christians are preparing to reenact the crucifixion on the streets of Jerusalem in full theatrical dress. Okay, how's that? Good. How's it feel? Okay, do I have another big pin, please? Another big pin, Jesus. The part of Jesus will be played by a computer programmer from Los Angeles. Get on it. Get on it like you usually do. Just lay down first. Probably this way better. Okay. I don't know if you guys do like that. Yeah, that's good. Huh? Go ahead. Because the rope is going to put you there anyway. Yeah. Don't oh, that's over. perfect. That's perfect. See, yeah. my foot feels comfortable and everything. That's good enough. Okay. I've been called to do it. I mean, it was not my role originally. I used to play one of the Roman soldiers, but I just had that passion and love for the Lord, so I really enjoy doing it. It's a great privilege. is awesome. In Jerusalem, even when you don't know it, especially what you do, it's, it's a place in which the past never died. Easter Saturday at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Thousands have arrived from all over the world for the Easter celebration. But the history of this church has not always reflected the ideals of brotherhood. The Christians ruled Jerusalem for over 300 years, from the time of Constantine up to the 7th century. But then to the east, in the ancient city of Mecca in Arabia, a powerful new religion began to emerge. In 610, an Arab named Muhammad ibn Abdallah had had a divine revelation that he was one of the great line of prophets stretching back through Jesus to Abraham and that his task was to bring the word of God to the Arabs of the Middle East. At first, Muhammad was forced into exile for his beliefs. 
By the time he died in 632, his Muslim followers numbered in the many thousands. Five years later, under the Caliph Omar, a Muslim army was encamped outside Jerusalem. They conquered it, taking it from the Christians. For the next four centuries under Muslim rule, Jerusalem enjoyed a period of prosperity and tolerance for all religions. But as the centuries passed and the countries of Europe became increasingly powerful, it became intolerable for the Christians of the West that Jerusalem should be ruled by the Muslim infidel. In 1096 AD, the Crusaders answered the call of the papacy to drive the Muslims out of Jerusalem. This band of supposedly chivalrous knights raped and pillaged their way across Europe. They butchered every Jew and Muslim they found on the way. When they finally reached Jerusalem, they laid siege to the city for 40 days. Once inside the gates, there was mayhem. Fulker of Chartres wrote, They rode into the city of peace, in blood up to their knees and the bridal reins. What a stench there was around the walls of the city, from all of the rotting bodies. But the Christians held the city for less than a hundred years before the Muslims recaptured it. The Muslims again allowed the Christians to worship in the church of the Holy Sepulchre. But then a new source of tension arose within the church itself. Over the centuries, Christianity had split into different groups. The Greek Orthodox, the Armenians, the Roman Catholics. Each wanted this most holy of sites for themselves. Arguments and fights became common. In the 19th century, disputes over this church became the trigger for the Crimean War. Peace only exists now because in 1757 an international tribunal imposed an agreement. Whatever the state of play between the different denominations at that time, so should it remain forever. An Armenian ladder which stood on the balcony in 1848 hasn't been moved for more than 140 years. The courtyard in front of the church was given to the Greeks the steps from the courtyard to the Catholics. But there have been arguments for years over the bottom step. Is it a step or is it a continuation of the courtyard? In 1920, two monks were killed in a riot over this issue. Inside the church, the story is much the same. In order to be able to live together, we had to divide up uh, the church between the communities. For example, the floor that we are standing on right now, it's jointly owned and uh, jointly maintained uh, by the three communities. The three communities that have rights in the Holy Civil Care, the Greek Orthodox, the Roman Catholic and the Armenians. Okay, the floor up to the point where the marble begins uh, is jointly owned. Where the marble is, it's owned by the Roman Catholic uh, Church. And the area beyond to the east there is uh, owned by the Greek Orthodox. Okay, this, uh, the pillars we see over here, they are owned, owned by the Greek Orthodox, but this particular pillar is half owned by the Roman Catholic and half by the Greek Orthodox. And we repair it, we fix it uh, diagonally, half of it belongs, let's say, to the Roman Catholics and half to the Greek Orthodox, and maintained by the equal parts by the two churches, the two communities. Every stone, every nail, every candle is accounted for and belongs to uh, different communities. There are at least seven different Christian denominations in and around the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The pressure for space is so great and the desire is so strong that there is even a group living on the roof. These buildings perched on top of the church house Jerusalem's Ethiopian clergy. 
They claim to be the oldest religious community to have lived continuously in Jerusalem, dating back three millennia to the days when the Queen of Sheba came to the city to seduce King Solomon. But the Ethiopians are the weakest of the Christian groups. Their deeds, which allowed them to pray in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, were destroyed in a fire 300 years ago. They've been banished from praying inside ever since. In our services, every day, we have prayers for the unification of all the Christians in the world. Unfortunately, it seems that we are not uh, really interested for unity in the church. We just talk about it, but we are not really interested, because if we were really interested, we'd find ways to get closer. Such is the power of faith. The closer you come to God, the harder it is to share him. The high point of the Jerusalem Easter is the ceremony of holy fire. More than 5,000 pilgrims have packed the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. They hope to witness a miracle. They believe that at exactly one o'clock, a plume of holy fire will descend from heaven and will appear within the tomb of Christ. For over a thousand years, the faithful have gathered here on Easter Saturday to witness this ancient ritual. But no one knows for sure if the fire will come again. This is always a sensitive occasion. All of the Orthodox denominations in the church at the same time, each trying to hold its own processions. The rules of the status quo are tested to breaking point. At the moment, it's the Egyptian cops turn to parade through the church. But while the head of their procession has reached the tomb, the tail has run into trouble. They've overstayed their welcome at the Rock of Golgotha. Punches have been thrown, and the result is mayhem. Israeli police have to move in to separate the two sides. They try to stop them praying, saying that time is over, your time is over. That's it. Now one of them, one of the Greek Orthodox, one of the Greek Orthodox, hit the bishop, and they start the clash. That's it. But as suddenly as the violence erupted, it is gone. It is almost time for the holy fire, and the atmosphere of the church has become fevered. Through the darkness, the Patriarch approaches the tomb of Christ. 
he alone will enter and receive the holy fire. As he disappears from view, the tension becomes almost unbearable. Will God send his fire? Slowly, the patriarch emerges from the tomb holding two flaming torches. Only he knows whether they were lit by God, but the faithful have no doubt. As the flame is passed from candle to candle, the church becomes carpeted with fire. The faithful put their hands through the flames, believing that this can do them no harm, that God will protect them. It is an event so typical of Jerusalem. Passion that tips into violence. Violence that tips into ecstasy. The extremes of emotion compressed into a space too small to contain them. understand anything of the, of the conflicts of this world. I just understand that this is a place where I've been born. I love. I can play. I can, I can do whatever I want because this is my home. Shireen al was born in Jerusalem. As a child, her family moved to the outskirts of the city. But she continued to visit often. Before anything else, for me, Jerusalem was the, the best place to go. If my father was going to Jerusalem, I will keep crying for like two or three hours to keep me with him. And if he didn't, I will just be angry for like three days. They should take me with them. That's what I understand when I'm kids. They should take me with them. And then I start to think about it in the other way. When I grew up, I started to think that, like, Jerusalem is a very important city. Jerusalem is the, the, the city of everybody looking for, Islam, Christian, and Judaism. Everybody looking for Jerusalem. Five times a day, Jerusalem resounds to the sound of the Muslim Yutsun, calling the Islamic faithful to prayer. There are more than a dozen mosques within the walls of the old city. But the center of Muslim life in Jerusalem is the Temple Mount, or the Haram al-Sharif in Arabic. This great expanse of paved stone dominates the old city of Jerusalem. The holiest spot of the city, it is now crowned by the golden dome of the rock. For hundreds of years, Muslims have gathered here to pray, to read and study the Quran 
to debate the details of Muslim law and practice. The Imam of the Dome of the Rock is their spiritual leader. It has been a great honor that has been granted me to live in Jerusalem, to be one of its sons. I have been living here for 40 years, where I have been preaching and guiding both Muslims and non-Muslims so that they should be guided towards God. And they should come together as one people. Jerusalem is the third holiest city of Islam after Mecca and Medina. The truth is very simple. This city is the city of prophets. From Adam to Abraham to Jesus, from Moses to our prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him. It is during the Muslim festival of Ramadan that activity on the Haram al-Sharif is at its most intense. Ramadan is the holiest festival of the Islamic calendar. For an entire month, the Muslim faithful fast from sunrise to sunset and dedicate themselves to prayer and contemplation. Thousands of Muslim pilgrims and residents converge on the Temple Mount. The precincts of the Dome of the Rock are packed with hundreds of thousands of worshippers. the Dome of the Rock and that yard and this church, everything there is I mean, giving me a special feeling. This is a special place. I wouldn't find these things in any, anywhere else in this world. When I start to pray, just, well, I don't know, it's mixed feeling with strongest and we feel strong and then I feel weak and then I start crying, I'm always crying. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. After the Crusades, Jerusalem had reverted to Muslim rule. The city was passed between various Arab empires until, in the 16th century, it came under the rule of the Ottoman Turks. Throughout this period, the city thrived. The Mamluks and the Ottomans built much of what is now Old Jerusalem, including the great city walls. Their mark can be seen throughout the city. But by the early 19th century, the Ottoman Empire had long fallen into decline. Jerusalem had shrunk to a dusty and neglected backwater, with a reported population of less than 10,000. But the 19th century was also the era of the Grand Tour. Wealthy travelers from Europe and America began to make journeys to the Holy Land in search of culture and education, and also a glimpse of the mysterious Arab East. Artists such as David Roberts painted romantic vistas of the city, of crumbling ruins populated by quaint Arab peasants which were immensely popular. Mark Twain was among the many notables who visited the city. We are surfeited with sights. They swarm about you at every step. No single foot of ground in all Jerusalem seems to be without a stirring and important history of its own. To us, Jerusalem will be an enchanted memory, a memory 
which money could not buy from us. And this was also the time of the birth of Zionism, the Jewish people's search for a homeland which would allow them to escape the anti-Semitism of Europe and express their own identity. They began to look to Jerusalem, their ancient capital, as the center of a modern Jewish state. The Jewish population of the city slowly began to grow. The new arrivals began to build their own neighborhoods just outside the walls of the old city. The district of Mea Shirim still stands, a self-contained village echoing the old ghettos of Eastern Europe. But it was not until the aftermath of the Second World War and the Holocaust that Jewish people were to make this their own land again. The State of Israel was formed in 1948. But the Arabs refused to recognize this new country. After a series of battles between the Israeli army and the Arab forces, the old city and the holy sites were in Arab hands. But the Israelis held the western suburbs, and the city was divided. It was not until 1967 that the history of Jerusalem was to come full circle. In the Six-Day War, after Arab attack, the Israeli army stormed the old city of Jerusalem. They swept aside the opposing forces and took it for the Jewish state. The city showed signs of desecration and ruin, with synagogues and graveyards vandalized or destroyed. But for the first time since 1948, the Jews were able to reach, to touch the Western Wall. The troops gathered there to pray and to thank God. And what of the Holy Mountain? At the Temple Mount, the experience of standing there, victorious, was to change some Jews forever. I was there for an entire three hours. And I thought to myself that after 2,000 years, which were wiped off the calendar, 2,000 years during which the Jewish people did not stand in this place. I am the first to have the privilege of standing here. These moments were probably the most important of my life. I felt I was beginning to fly. I felt I was in a dream. I felt I had received a gift from heaven. For Rabbi Yisrael Ariel, the experience was only too brief. For the sake of peace, the Israelis handed the Temple Mount back to the Muslims. But after 2,000 years of exile, the Jewish people now held Jerusalem again. It is the Feast of Passover. At the Western Wall, the faithful gather to celebrate one of the most important Jewish festivals. They are commemorating the night that Moses led the Jewish people from their first exile in Egypt and the start of their long journey back to the Promised Land, to Jerusalem. The scrolls of the Torah, the ancient Hebrew Bible, are raised above the worshippers' heads. It is in this holy book that the Jewish people can find God's promise that this is their home. Judaism without Jerusalem is, uh, is like a body without a heart. 
This, this is the heart of the Jewish people. The notion of Jerusalem in all its glory is synonymous with the notion of the Jewish people in all their glory. They are inseparable. But Jerusalem is not only central to the Orthodox Jews. Every time I walk here, I'm reminded of the stories of our prophets, the stories of our forefathers and foremothers. The beauty now is we can come back here and, and retell the story and feel it again, feel it and smell it and touch it again in ways we couldn't for centuries. Naomi Kelman lived in Jerusalem as a child when the Arabs still held the old city. Only after the Six-Day War was she able to walk its streets. You walk throughout the city and you walk our ancient history and you live our modern history and they are totally intermingling. It is on a Friday afternoon that Jerusalem takes on its most unique character. This is the beginning of Shabbat, the Jewish Sabbath or day of rest, which runs from sunset on Friday to sunset on Saturday. People are going to get ready to pray. They feel a little like a release. It's the day off. Okay, as the Shabbat comes in, people come. You see people, more people coming down here. They come in their better clothes, the Shabbat clothes. It is a day of getting spiritually tuned in with God, with Judaism, with family. It's a Jewish day. As sundown approaches, the traders in the Jewish markets begin to shut up their stalls. At the central bus station, passengers rush to catch the last bus out of town. The rules of Shabbat are strict. There are 39 different categories of work that a Jew may not undertake on the Sabbath. Driving a car or a bus is one of them. All around the city, the faithful ready themselves to pray. At sunset, the Israeli public transportation system will shut down. The announcement, the commencement of Shabbat, the siren goes off, so all of Jerusalem hears it, and now it's time to stop doing any type of creative work. In the areas where the most Orthodox Jews live, roadblocks go up. Nowhere on earth are the principles of Jewish religious law taken so seriously. But the laws of God and the desires of man do not always match, even in Jerusalem. There are many secular Jews who wish to drive on the Sabbath. The Bar Elan Road is one of Jerusalem's major thoroughfares, but it also runs through one of the city's most orthodox Jewish areas. Many of the ultra-orthodox want this road closed on the Sabbath, but the city authorities refuse to do so. This is increasingly becoming uh, a challenge. How can we as Jews live together in this city? The ultra-Orthodox feel compelled to impress their lifestyle on their neighbors, regardless what their neighbor's lifestyle is. Can't there be one place in the world where Sabbath is really Sabbath, where the Jewish Sabbath is, exists in the context of the world, and if there's going to be such a place, is that place not Jerusalem? On this particular day, the authorities win. But the growing ultra-Orthodox population of Jerusalem is exerting more and more influence. For them, the Moshiach, the Jewish Messiah, will not come until all of the world's Jews have congregated in this, their promised land.
as the Jewish population expands, new homes, entire new suburbs of Jerusalem, steadily rise on the surrounding hills. This has become a cause of bitter resentment. For the Palestinians, we live in the city. It is not only the holiness and special significance of Jerusalem and Islam that's important for us. This is where I live. This is where, I, where my father was born. This is where my great-grandfather was born. We just take it back to the 7th century. It's our identity. It's our history. It's our family archive. It is who I am. Assalamu alaikum. Walid Ayad is a Palestinian born in Arab East Jerusalem. At the time of the Six-Day War, he was studying in California. The Israeli army took over his family home. Thirty years later, he has returned. It's a feeling of any human being. Any human being loves to come back home. That's nature. Even the birds, when they, when they travel, they like to come back. This is, uh, used to be the veranda, for example, the old times when I used to live here as a, as a child, my veranda. This is the bedroom of my grandfather. Over there, the bedroom of my father. My bedroom over there, my brothers over there, my sisters over there, verandas, and that's our home. His home may be the same, but Walid has returned to a different Jerusalem. The borders of Jerusalem have been changed many times, but most dramatically after the Six-Day War. From his rooftop, Walid can see the Golden Dome of the Rock less than a mile away, but his home is no longer part of the city. As a Palestinian, he is no longer guaranteed entry. Whenever political tensions rise, the Israelis close the borders between the city and the Arab areas outside. I came all the way from California, 8,000 miles, to go to Jerusalem, to go to my homeland, crossing oceans, continents, airports, you name it. The last mile is the hardest one. My permit clearly states I cannot go into closed areas. I can't go, I can't go to Jerusalem, I can't go. From there to here, I can't go. From this line to the west, I can't. Jerusalem is a city at the heart of a bitter conflict. The streets are patrolled day and night by Israeli soldiers. Jerusalem is cold. It seems almost ironical, the city of peace. It was never a peaceful place. Never. Never in its history was it a peaceful place. It was always a place in which, I would say, people are inbred for, for some kind of, of fighting. The conflict between the Israelis and Palestinians appears intractable. Under the gaze of the world's press, skirmishes and fights between Arab youths and Israeli soldiers hardly any older have occurred repeatedly in and around Jerusalem. And the holiest places are inevitably the greatest points of tension. Over the past three decades, there have been violent incidents on and around the Temple Mount involving radicals from various groups. Jewish extremists have threatened to break into the area and on a number of occasions have succeeded. At other times, Muslims have thrown stones and boulders down onto the Western Wall. Israeli police and soldiers have moved in, firing tear gas and, on occasion, live ammunition. 
the sense of paranoia and distrust is rarely allowed to fade. If you demolish the three holy places of Jerusalem, you'll get three holy craters in the ground. People will come there and will will fight each other over the position of the crater. Nothing will be basically changed. The city lives on the edge of instability. There are checkpoints on every road in and out of Arab areas outside Jerusalem. Cars are stopped, checked. Every Palestinian has to have the correct papers or they will not be allowed into the city. All the way, I was seeing these the soldiers. All the way. So I become very nervous, very nervous. For Shireen to pray at the Dome of the Rock, she has to pass through two separate Israeli checkpoints. If you have someone who hasn't permission, who hasn't the ID, or someone who forget his ID, someone forget his ID in big trouble, in real trouble, just because he forgot it. This become like, I hate the ID. I hate to show it. I hate the colors of the ID. I'm not fundamentalist. I'm just the one who tried to live in peace and with my dignity. That's all. I can't, I can't, I can't understand someone treat me, humiliate me or humiliate anyone I know. We just have four or five bumper suicide and we all punished. Is that justice? I will myself would be bumper suicide one day if they just keep treating me that way. Suicide bombings are the latest escalation in Palestinian terrorism. They have claimed more than a hundred lives in Jerusalem in the course of a single year. Horrific and almost impossible to defend against, they only perpetuate an atmosphere of violence and terror. Talmud, it is written that God created ten parts of beauty. Nine were bestowed on Jerusalem, and only one to the rest of the world. But it is also said that God then created ten parts of pain, and God also bestowed nine of these on Jerusalem. have died in the attempt. And nothing basically has changed. Everybody comes here armed, determined, and they want to have this holy city for themselves. You can feel it in the air. When you live here, you feel it. You feel it when you see the people, when you hear, when you smell, when you see the stones, when you see the graves, when you see the light of Jerusalem, which is not nice to your eyes. It's a different place. outside old Jerusalem are covered in graves. Millions of them. The dead of 3,000 years. Jewish graves. Muslim graves. Christian graves. Islam, Judaism, and Christianity all believe that there will be a final reckoning between the forces of good and evil, that the dead will be brought back to life, and that there will be a day of judgment. All of them believe that this will happen in Jerusalem. 
To be buried in Jerusalem is to be one of the first to rise again. For the Israeli National Airline, the dead are regular passengers. Each year, hundreds of coffins are flown in. Their occupants wish to be buried on the Mount of Olives overlooking the city. These latest immigrants to Israel are signed over to Rabbi Gelbstein. As the prophet says, the Mount of Olives is where the Redeemer will stand at the end of days, where the announcement of the redemption will take place and where the dry bones will be resurrected. In our sources, it is said that when the Jews are resurrected, those who are buried near Jerusalem will have a shorter way to travel to the temple. So he who is buried on the Mount of Olives, the closest place to the temple, spares himself the torments and tribulations he might have had otherwise as a result of his resurrection. What? I do not have any doubt that the redemption is very close, even closer than I can imagine. Jesus will come, place his feet on the Mount of Olives. It's supposed to split in half and then walk through the Kidron Valley and into the Eastern Gate into the Temple and take his rightful position as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jerusalem is the place where mankind will be collected on the day of judgment. The day when earth will be a different earth. And the day when the heavens will be different. There is no doubt about this. This is a sacred city. gates of the Haram al-Sharif swing shut. The doors of the Holy Sepulchre are locked for the night. By the western wall, the Israelis celebrate their return to Jerusalem. city above all others. Man has strived to touch the eternal, to talk with God. It's amazing how we can live in one city which has so many different groups and almost never talk to one another. When we live so close to each other in the state of political conflict, the proximity makes us lose sight of how similar we all are. Peoples, races, Nations pass and die, flee and return. It seems that only the stones of Jerusalem remain constant and unyielding. Only they and the power of their holiness can outlast the passing millennia. Can truly touch the eternal. <laughs> 